The title of today's khutbah has been given to you as this title of purification of the soul. Purification, purification of one's inner self. And there is no way to purify oneself better than turning to the Book of Allah. How could there be when this is Allah's speech? The speech that gives life to dead hearts. So it truly does give life. And nothing is similar to it. This topic is so important that Allah in the Quran, in a surah that we all memorize, He swears oaths by different things in His creation, majestic things in the creation. The sun, the moon, the nafs that He created, and so many other things. Allah swears 10 or 11 continuous oaths, 11 of them. In this surah that we all memorize, which is Allah saying, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, Bismillahi rahmani rahim, wa shamsi wa duhaha." Continuous oaths. Why? For this one purpose. For this one statement. The object of the oaths is this one particular fact. Qad aflah man zakaha. That truly. This person who purifies his soul is the successful one. No one else. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And as for the one who makes it dirty and filthy, he is the loser, the ultimate loser. This is how important it is. This topic, you can cover it from so many different angles. So many different ways of looking at this topic. But I want to look at it from another surah of the Qur'an. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do. Because this surah reminds us of our final destination. And the beginning of the end. Because whenever we remember the end, as the scholars mention, you never remember your demise, death. And everything to do with death. In a time of ease, except that it constricts that ease. You think you're free to do whatever you like without any account, without anything to pay for? No. It wakes you up and says, no. Beware. Watch your step. Be mindful. And nor is this remembered in a time of difficulty. When things are all on top of you, when things are all problematic, when everything seems difficult even to take a breath, seems painful and difficult, except it brings ease. Because you remember, life is but moments. And every moment passes. And this is not the be-all and end-all. There's something much greater to our lives than this, that which is around us. So which surah do I want to look at? A surah that the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, as in one narration from a tirmidhi it is worth a half of the Qur'an. And in the other narration in a tirmidhi it is worth a quarter of the Qur'an. Now what I want you to take away from this, whether it is a half or whether it is a quarter, I want you to take away that this surah has an immense meaning. Due to that fact, with Allah in the sight of Allah, it has a grand status. We all know Surah Al-Ikhlas is worth a third of the Qur'an. Why? Because it only talks about Allah. It only talks about Allah. So this Surah is so important in our lives, it nourishes us as if it gives us the value of a quarter of the Qur'an or a half. It nourishes us like half of the Qur'an or a quarter of the Qur'an nourishes us. Nourishment for the soul. We need the nourishment of the whole Qur'an. There is nothing that's going to purify you like all of the Qur'an. Yet, some of us are not so proficient in our reading of the Qur'an. Some of us do not have the luxury of time because of this rat waste race that we're in and the necessities of life. And because Allah hasn't given us that much wealth and time. 
Like one companion when he came to the Prophet wasallam, similar to him, and he wanted to learn some Qur'an and he wanted the Prophet wasallam to teach him Qur'an. And the Prophet wasallam mentioned to him different parts of the Qur'an, lengthier parts, and the man kept saying, I'm too old and my tongue is very difficult and my heart doesn't contain or isn't able to keep all of this. So give me something small. And he kept saying something smaller, something smaller until the Prophet ﷺ reached this surah. Which surah? The surah that begins with Allah's statement, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا Every one of us memorizes this surah. The Prophet ﷺ described this surah rather a part of this surah. In hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asked about zakah. Is there any zakah to be given on donkeys? Any people in that time wanted to know what is the right of Allah in everything. Something insignificant looked down upon a donkey. Yet the people at that time had pure nufus, pure hearts, pure souls that they wanted to know. If there is a right of Allah, I want to know it so I can make sure I fulfill that right. So in this hadith of Bukhari, they ask him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is there any zakah to be paid on donkeys? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Lam yanzil alayya, there is nothing revealed concerning this matter to me so far except this ayah. And he says, this ayah, al jami al fadha He says, this comprehensive verse, which is unique. And then he recites from the end of this surah, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ And whoever does an atom's weight of good, he will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil, he will see it. Al-Wahidi, رحمه الله تعالى, talking about why this surah came down, he mentions another narration and he says, there was two, two types of men, two men. One, he didn't see giving small amounts of charity like any, a piece of bread. And it's something very small in charity, helping someone. He didn't see that as very significant such that Allah will reward for it. So he took these things lightly. And another man who used to take small sins, yani not what we consider to be major sins. So what are small sins? You know, like just the other day someone said to me, yeah, I have to say white lies every now and then. White lies we call them. Lies. Telling lies. These small things that we think are insignificant. That's what he used to do. And when it comes to talking about people and saying bad things about them, slander and backbiting, he used to get involved with it and he didn't consider it to be anything. Unfortunately, we know these things too well. Unfortunately. So he didn't see these small sins and even gazing at things which are haram. He didn't see them as significant. So Al-Wahidi mentions this narration and this is why the surah was revealed. Why? To tell you that these things are all significant. That you need to hasten to every type of good no matter how small or big it is. And you need to refrain from all evil. However big or small it is, everything has significance because everything, all of it, is either seen by Allah as virtuous or seen as a transgression against the limits of Allah, the rights of Allah. All of it. So how does the surah begin? It's a scene that Allah creates for us. Even the rhythm of the surah Powerful, severe. Allah says, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا When the earth quakes in its final quaking. Now just reflect on that. What image does that create in your mind? Maybe you've seen some YouTube fit footage of an earthquake when it happens and what happens to people. Maybe you've seen it. And I know you've all seen We've all seen the movie clips where there's destruction on the earth. 
And we've probably all seen, inshallah, we've probably all seen where they put those clips together and they had the ayat over playing them so from Surah Al Qiyamah, I think it was, or from other surahs. And we see that destruction that happens. You know, when the earth quakes, people run for cover, they run into a doorway, they run under a table, they run for protection. They're looking for stability, anything that will be firm. So how will it be in the final quaking? Where there is no stability in the universe, forget the earth. And everything shakes and shivers and quakes. And there is no way to run. And there's no way to hide. And it's not you or your family or your neighbors or your community or your country, it is every continent in the world, rather every speck in the universe. Because all of it is being destroyed, as Allah has promised. A fact that will happen, there's nowhere to run. In that final quaking, how will we be? That's how the surah opens. وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا And the earth will bring forth its contents. Have you ever thought about that meaning? That day, what are the contents? Yani, we know the Mufassirun talk about the graves and how they're gonna come, people are going to come out of the graves. But look at how Allah describes it. The burdens. The burden that the earth is carrying, it wants to get rid of it. It wants to spit it out. Are we a burden on this earth? Walking upon it, are we a burden? And the ones that are buried inside it, are they a burden that the earth wants to spit them out? We talk about pollution of the world. We talk about how man has polluted the world. There's a pollution which is unseen. The pollution of sins. As our brother and Sheikh, Sheikh Umar was talking about last week. The evil effects of sins. Or a topic like that. This is an unseen pollution. That we are committing day in day out. That the world is committing. That the world in its majority is committing and involved in and engrossed in. This is the world we live in. The world wants to spit it all out. You look around you. There's no barakah in the food that we eat. It doesn't nourish. It doesn't give you the nutrients that it's meant to give you. The produce of the earth is not like what it used to be. Why? The barak has taken out of it. Because we've polluted it with all of this. And we don't pay any attention to it. وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا And in this verse, this should stop you. We've all seen earthquakes. We've all seen tsunamis. In the technological age that we live in, we've saw, seen every type of destruction. Yet on that day, the destruction is such that man will say, every human being, what's wrong with this place? What's wrong with this universe and this earth? It's something unimaginable. It is so far beyond our imagination and so terrifying that every person, even though we've seen what we've seen, and been exposed to what we've been exposed to, is going to be dumbfounded. And then, Allah reminds us how this earth is going to speak. Because Allah has ordered it to speak about what's happened on this earth. A witness against us. And then, the two final verses. After Allah tells us, you are all going to be presented in groups in front of Allah. To face the consequences of everything that we've done. This is the reality. Any action leads to a consequence. And then when the translators say to you an atom's weight. An atom's weight. Back in that time when the Prophet ﷺ was reciting these ayat. And soon after those times. What did they understand by dharra? They understood Things like the dust particles that we see when the sun hits them. That's what they knew. And they knew about the small ants 
So when they thought of dharra, what we translate now as atom, they were likening it to this. So that amount of good that you do, you will see it. It's never going to be lost in value. Allah records it. Allah rewards for it. And Allah takes a mustard seed, which is like this dharra. And he takes it in his right hand. Subhana. And then he makes it grow until it becomes the size of a mountain. This is the generosity of Allah. But at the same time, if it's an atom's weight of evil, it's recorded and seen by Allah. There's no escape. And then Allah will take us to account for it. May Allah forgive us. There's nothing that's going to escape. Now that's what they thought. It was this dust particle size. In our times, what do we know? We know about particles that we can't see. We know the existence. The corona. The covid we can't see it. We know about an atom and what an atom is made of and its particles. And we know that atoms have weight and these parts of the atoms have weight. So things that we can't even see to that level, Allah will take us to account? Yes. So the Prophet wasallam he turns to his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. She is who she is, our mother, our mother, the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the one Allah chose her for him, and He loved her more than any other woman from His wives after Khadija radiallahu anha. What did He say to her? He says to her, Ya Aisha. إِيَّاكِ وَالْمُحْقِرَاتِ أَعْمَالِ in this riwayah of Ibn Majah. He says, beware of all actions, these small insignificant ones, beware of them. Why? Because Allah will call you to account for even these small minor things that you think are minor. Now when we think about these types of yani, surahs, these types of narrations, when we hear about this end that is definitely going to happen, it's done and dusted. As Muslims, what do we normally do? We turn, if our hearts are awake, if our hearts are alive, we turn to salah, we turn to sadaqah, we turn to dhikr of Allah, we turn to Quran. But is the purification of our soul limited to these types of deeds and are they the greatest things that you could do and is this how we should weigh up our iman and the purity of our hearts that's the question i want you to think about for these few moments of pause shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyya from amongst many scholars he makes this statement in a book that he wrote rahimahullah ta'ala which was all about challenging anti-Islamic behaviors, rhetoric, and values. That's what the whole book's about. And he says, in his discourse, he says, the way you weigh up a people's iman, the quality of their iman, the quality of their hearts, the purification they have in them, it's not by their salah and their sadaqah and their qiyam. None of this. You weigh it up by how much they challenge Islamophobia or anti-Islam. This is what defines a people's quality of iman. This is what it is. Right now, we have Islamophobia all over the world. Even from those who are claiming to be Muslim. We have it on such a global level. Why? Because this anti-Islamic rhetoric has to be adhered to. We look over injustice because of whatever other reasons. We have within our own communities things that are going on. Challenges 
for schools with the COVID situation, our children in secondary schools not being able to pray their salah. Excuses like they can't use any wudu area. They can't gather anymore. They've just started school. They've been going for about a week and they can't pray. And they have to struggle to pray. When we were sending them back to school, did we plan? Did we take up this issue? We were buying their school uniforms and their bags and their other bits and pieces. Were we thinking about the Islam? We have the legislation that's coming to effect now where it is not optional for parents anymore to say our children can't learn about sex education. The topic, if it's taught in that topic, you can take your kids out. But if it's taught under this other topic, health and relationship education, which all of it can come under this one now, you have no choice. Have we challenged any of this rhetoric, this anti-Islam? We see the decline of society in its, vo yani in its manners, its etiquette, in its morals. Have we challenged it at all? Have we stood up and said, no, I'm not going to accept this. I'm going to do everything in my power to stop this. Because all of these things and to stand up against that, will purify your soul. And it will have consequences, not just for you. It will have consequences for your family, your community, your society, your country. Not for one generation. For generations to come. Just imagine the hasanat that that can bring. But normally, what we find with people from our community, stand up against these challenges. What's their complaint? Their complaint is that the Muslim community is apathetic or shows so much apathy, not wanting to do anything. That it has to be made so easy before they do something. If it is more than just to do a click, they won't do it. Is that how we've become? We're not willing to sacrifice time, energy, money, for the sake of Allah and His Messenger. Because if that's how we're going to be, then Allah will get rid of us and replace us with the people who are sincere to Him, that love Him and He loves them. Who will stand up for His deen against all kinds of oppression. It's as simple as that. The deen of Allah will prevail. It's a promise by Allah, guaranteed. Three places in the Quran Allah promises. You all know them, they all start. Allah is the one who sent his messenger and the religion of truth to make it prevail. It's a done, dusted deal. It's gonna happen. No worries. The only worry is which side are we gonna be on? Which side? If we stood up and lived our lives to stand up for Allah and His Messenger. That purifies your soul. It's not enough just to do your salah and your zakah and your siyam and your hajj. It's not enough. If you don't stand up and sacrifice for Allah and His Messenger, there will come a moment where the challenge will come to you. May Allah protect us from this. And if we're not used to sacrificing for the sake of Allah, we're not going to handle the challenge. And we will be as the Prophet ﷺ says, it's going to come upon people a time where the fitan are going to be so dreadful. They're going to be the, like the darkest pieces of night. What's going to happen in that time? Yusbihul mar. A man in the morning, mu'minan, he will be a believer. And by the evening, a disbeliever. If you're not used to sacrificing for the sake of Allah, you will never truly purify your nafs. You will never truly be protected against nifaq and failing at the challenges. The more you sacrifice, the more you fight for Allah and His Messenger, 
in all the legal ways possible, in all of the ways to promote justice, promote good. If we don't get used to this, we're going to fall with everyone else. May Allah protect us.